All of us, I'm sure, have daydreamed of a day where we just go into work and our boss looks at us and he says, you know what, today you can just do whatever you feel like. And many of us have been frustrated or annoyed when we share a new hobby that we found with a friend. And the first question is, you know, what's the point or what's your goal with all of this? And if you've watched a few videos on this channel, then you've probably questioned why educational assessment, while it aims to measure intelligence, often feels like it does the opposite. If you can relate to any of those scenarios, then I think you're really going to enjoy this short presentation and introduction to an amazing book called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned, The Myth of the Objective. This book is written by two authors, uh, Kenneth Stanley and Joel Lehman, and they are a couple of computer scientists researching artificial intelligence. And while they were doing their research, they uncovered a fatal flaw with the objective-based thinking in the field of artificial intelligence. But they realised that it didn't just exist within the field of artificial intelligence, it actually extends much further than that into pretty much every area of modern life. I've shared this book with a lot of my close friends and they all unanimously agree that this is the kind of book that it's like a must read. It will change your perspective on goals and objectives, which are generally seen as, you know, overwhelmingly positive and they will make you rethink the way that you're living your life. So I'm very glad to be able to just share a couple of the ideas and arguments that Kenneth and Joel make in this book in this very short presentation in the hope that you will then go on to read the full book and check out the presentations that Kenneth has done on YouTube. So it goes without saying that in this book, Kenneth and Joel are going to be very critical of objectives and metrics and how they impact our understanding of progress. So one of the points that the book really makes you reflect on is how objectives have crept into pretty much every aspect of our lives um, to the point that we believe, as Kenneth says, that any worthy social accomplishment is best achieved by first setting it as an objective and then pursuing it together with conviction. It's clear to us that objectives are at the forefront of certain fields. For example, economics has long-run GDP growth targets, investment growth targets, and so on. In education, of course, we have grades, and the goal is to increase students' scores on assessments each year. And in science, uh, in order to receive funding, scientists need to be able to say what their objective is once they receive this funding. You know, what's their goal? Or what are they planning to do with the money that they receive? But Kenneth and Joel point out that Objectives also lurk in the background of our daily lives. For example, in our hobbies, we often try to set goals and deadlines, expectations and uh, targets for ourselves to achieve a certain thing by a certain time. Even in the most subjective areas of our lives, for example, finding a partner, uh, dating websites will often ask you, you know, what's your type? What are you looking for? Now, at this point, you might actually be thinking that that doesn't actually all sound that bad. After all, aren't objectives supposed to uh, give us something to strive for, motivate us? to help us to achieve great things. But while the common view of objectives is that they create potential for achievement, Kenneth and Joel argue literally the opposite. They say that by setting objectives, you're actually massively constraining your ability to achieve great things. And as for why that is, we'll explore it later in the presentation. The second thing that uh, Kenneth and Joel are very critical of in their book is the use of metrics. So metrics in our society are basically seen as the compass that we use to direct us towards the goals that we've set. For example, in economics, we have GDP, the most popular indicator of economic growth. And we expect that as GDP increases, we're basically getting closer and closer towards our goal. And if it ever decreases, that must mean we're moving further away from it. Likewise, in the education system, we have GPAs and grades. And we expect that as students increase their GPAs or grades, uh, they're basically increasing their intelligence, and if your GPA ever declines, that must be a bad sign. Of course, there are many other examples of these metrics that we use in our daily lives, since they've become so filled with them. Benchmarks, milestones, KPIs at work, uh, the list goes on and on. But just like objectives, metrics have this tendency to creep into your daily life in areas where you might not even expect them. And despite reading this book over a year ago, discussing it with many different people and thinking about the ideas a lot, I'm certainly not immune, so I can give you a personal example here from my guitar practice data, which I track pretty religiously. The idea was that by tracking my guitar practice data, I could gradually increase it over time. And the expectation was that this would lead to me achieving certain goals, like for example, being able to record an album or come up with a great composition, a great piece of music. But what this book really makes you question is whether tracking these metrics and expecting them to lead towards your goal is really the right approach or whether we're actually just being deceived by metrics. 
Finally, objectives and metrics combine to influence how we see progress as a whole. Kenneth and Joel argue that since we use objectives and metrics in so many different areas of our lives now, we've basically come to believe that progress itself depends on us setting objectives and using metrics to track our progress towards them. We've essentially decided as society that objectives and measurable metrics are the only route to achievement. So let's take a closer look at the arguments Kenneth and Joel make against objectives, beginning with the argument that goals kill rather than create opportunity. So to illustrate this point, I've created a simple interactive visualization. So if you imagine yourself as this bee over here, and you imagine yourself uh, flying through the environment looking for flowers uh, with nectar on them, then let's assume that the bee follows the advice of human society at large and decides to set an objective, a specific flower it wants to fly to. Let's imagine it sets it to this one over here. Then it also decides to use the distance towards that flower as its metric. As its distance decreases, it knows it's going in the right direction. And if the distance towards that flower increases, then it knows it's going in the wrong direction. So let's see what that would look like. The bee would go along here, go up here, it would realize that going down here is the wrong way, so it would go back down here, around here, do do do, and gradually makes its way towards the objective. So clearly the bee's decision to use an objective here has a major drawback. If we reach out the flight path of a bee, then as it flies down here, you can see that had it decided to uh, fly into this flower and explore this region of the environment, then it would have found a pretty dense uh, region of interesting flowers to land on and do whatever bees do on flowers. But because the metric the bee is using is telling it that it's going in the wrong direction, uh, it never gets the opportunity to explore this region of the environment. Of course, this analogy is also applicable to human life. If you imagine yourself going through life uh, encountering interesting stepping stones, as Kenneth calls them, towards interesting things like a new career, a new hobby, or even a scientific invention, or a new business. If you've set a specific objective that doesn't align perfectly with the objectives that you've set and the metrics that you're using to tell that you're making progress, then you're going to abandon a lot of interesting stepping stones that could lead to great things. But this tendency of objectives to kill rather than create opportunity is only the first criticism that Kenneth and Joel have of objectives. The second one is that uh, objectives and metrics can be deceptive. So for this, I've created another interactive visualization, which is a maze. And similar to the last one, um, the bee has an objective of getting to the golden nugget at the end of the maze and it's going to use uh, a similar metric as it used in the last visualization, which is the distance towards the golden nugget. So getting closer is considered better and getting further away is considered worse. But what's interesting about this maze is that it's been set up in such a way that the B immediately goes down this path because it sees that it's getting closer towards the goal, but it runs itself into a dead end uh, although the metric tells the bee that it's making progress towards its goal, ultimately following this path can never lead to it reaching the golden nugget. I think this is one of the most important concepts that I took away from the book, the concept of deception in search, which basically means that even though your metric is telling you that you're getting closer towards your objective, even though your compass is telling you that you're uh, making progress towards your goal, you might actually just be running yourself into a dead end like this bee over here. And I think it's also useful to see this uh, again in the previous visualization. So if I take you back to this one over here, if you imagine that the bee had set its objective as uh, getting to this flower over here, well, you'll notice that this region of the environment is completely disconnected from any of the other paths. And for that reason, when it starts flying towards its objective, even though the compass that it's using, the metric that it's using to measure its progress, is telling it that it's making progress towards its objective, ultimately it's impossible for the bee to get to this region of the map. So depending on how stubborn and persistent the bee is, and how rigidly it sticks to its objective, it might end up being a life of disappointment for this bee. 
This concept of deception in search is very common and you can see it in lots of different areas. For example, in economics, when the GDP is rising, uh, we feel great because we feel like we're making progress towards a better economy. But it's not always the case that uh, an economy with a larger and larger GDP will have people living inside that economy who are having better and better quality of life. And similarly, when the GDP drops, it's not always such a bad thing. Sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. Sometimes the economy needs to go into recession in order for there to be a, another wave of economic growth. Likewise, there are many public intellectuals today who are very concerned about the stagnation in science and innovation. But let's take a look at the maze again to show why this might be misguided. In order to get to the objective, uh, the golden nugget, but in this case it would be the next Cambrian explosion of scientific innovation and technological advancement, the bee needs to actually uh, suffer through a period of its metric telling it that it's getting worse, it's not making any progress needs to go through a recession or a period of stagnation. But by the time it gets to its objective, you realize that the bee was always making progress towards its objective. It's just that the metric we were using to track the progress was flawed. So assuming that Kenneth and Joel's criticisms are correct, how should we change our lives in order to avoid the deceptive metrics and objectives they talk about in their book? Kenneth and Joel suggest that instead of setting specific objectives, Instead, we should just collect stepping stones. We should just follow our interests. And as we run across things that seem interesting or like they might contain potential, we should explore them and see where the path leads. Instead of trying to globally optimize our lives and create a kind of curriculum for ourselves, a path that we must follow until the end. Although there's a downside, which is that you won't be able to say exactly where you're trying to go. The benefit is that you won't be deceived by misleading metrics and you won't have uh, rigid objectives leading you into dead ends because you aren't actually trying to get to somewhere specific. You're completely open to uh, the possibilities, the stepping stones that will be presented to you as you go through life. All right, guys, so I actually have a lot more to say here, but this is already getting way too long for a summary. So uh, I'm gonna direct you to another video I made around a year ago called there is no good learning without pleasure, where I talk about something called the learn drive, which is a concept that has a lot of overlapping features with Kenneth Stanley's concept of following the interestingness gradient. So there'll be a link to that in the description. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.